All right, let's go to uh, John chapter number four. John chapter number four. Our actual text is verse 11 through 19. But for unity's sake, uh, I will read, reread what we've already studied the last two weeks. John uh, chapter number four, uh, our Lord's journey into Samaria, his winning a lady to the Lord himself, as we will see in the uh, next couple of weeks then, she eventually becomes a, a witness for Christ to her hometown and revival comes. So, John chapter 4, uh, I'm going to go ahead and read through uh, verse number 19, and then we'll expound on verse 11 through 19. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. He left Judea and departed again into Galilee. Now this would be the Gentile Galilee, Samaria. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh thee to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. there. Jesus, therefore, being weary with the journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me? which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank of himself and his children and his cattle? Of course, the answer is absolutely yes. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that thou saidst truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Beginning at verse number 11 and moving forward, I just want to remind you of a couple of things. Uh, this is a great, great chapter on teaching us how to talk to people about the Lord, how to share our testimony. If you will just do a casual reading through this entire chapter on your own, you can pick up all kinds of little tidbits on what to do and what not to do. Uh, I'm, I'm still working on and debating about uh, when we actually get done with the chapter, going back and, and doing a whole lesson on about a dozen things that are there to teach us uh, how to uh, witness. Uh, the Lord's dealing with this woman is a sample case of God's gracious dealings with any sinner. Uh, just kind of to give you an idea of how much is here, I, I made seven notes, seven thoughts on how the Lord dealt with her and what that can teach us. Number one, 
Uh, the Lord took the initiative. This lady was never talked to the Lord. Uh, don't wait for people to walk up to you and say, hey, show me how to get saved. Don't, don't do that. We don't expect that. Uh, we love him because he first loved us. You and I need to be spiritually alert, kind of like spiritual radar running around in our head as to when you have an opportunity to talk to somebody about the Lord. Lord took the initiative. And I've talked about the history of the Samaritans, why she never would have started the conversation. I want you to notice, secondly, his first uh, words, give and me, give me to drink. Uh, the word give is, uh, is a grace word. It's a grace word. <clears throat> The Lord gives us. Salvation is free. It's by grace. The word give is a grace word. And if you'll think about that word give in your everyday life, if you'll, you'll be amazed how many opportunities you might have to say uh, something uh, about the Lord to someone. Then, of course, the little word me talks about Christ. He draws attention to himself. And it draws us back to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Thirdly, uh, he asks her for a drink, opening himself up to her and revealing to her her helplessness. Remember, sinners are dead in trespasses and sins, uh, there has to be some connection between the person wanting to witness and, and the person that needs witness to. Um, years ago when I was teaching an evangelism class at Arlington Baptist College, we always talked about when you go into a home to make a visit and you sit down, take a quick look around the room. You're going to find something there to help you start the conversation. You're not going to walk into somebody's house, sit down and say, all right, now it's turn or burn time. Hey, come on. <laughs> uh, if, if, if you want to get booted out real quick, that's the way you would do that. But I always tell young preachers, I always told young preachers, take a look around. Uh, you're going to find something there as a conversation starter, and they'll open up to you. You see of a man in a picture holding a big fish. Man, start there. Look down the hall, and you can see 20 pictures of grandkids. You want to win them right away? Talk about man, grandkids. Lady's got some antique furniture there. Use your head. Find something. You know, everybody knows I love old cars. You cannot believe how many conversations I've just naturally started with someone that I've never seen before in my life because I complimented their clean old car. Are you as clean on the inside as your car is out here? See what I mean? Use your hand. He asked to drink, pointing her to herself. Number four, um, to all this, the woman immediately exhibited her prejudice and suspicion. When you finally get an open door to talk to somebody, don't expect them to say, you know, I've been wanting to talk to somebody about the Lord for 30 years. I'm sure glad you stopped here today. Don't expect that. Expect opposition. She responded with prejudice and suspicion. You're a Jew and you're talking to me, a Samaritan? How? Whence? Why? Excuses. It's a picture 
of the enmity between, uh, of the carnal mind against God. Number five, the woman was totally ignorant about Christ. One thing that I know for sure in my own life, in the life of you and in the life of others, we're bad, as Christians, we're bad about expecting too much spiritually out of other people. Think about what I just said. We're bad, and I know I am, we're bad about expecting too much out of other people spiritually. Just because you see somebody and they've got a Bible laying on the dashboard of their car doesn't mean they've read it. Just because they tell you, well, I'm a Baptist, that doesn't mean they have a clue what that's all about. Well, when I was a kid, I went to such and such a church. You know what that means? Absolutely nothing. We, we assume too much. One of the great verses in the Bible about that is Acts 13, 27, when, when, when uh, um, the, the preaching ministry started going abroad, uh, there's a verse that says, you read the Old Testament every Sabbath in your congregation, and yet when the Lord came, you did not know him. Do not assume. Because people go to church, because people have a Bible, because people have religious talk, do not assume that they're saved or even know how. Especially in today's society when the vast majority of homes, the Bible is not read and children are not taught anything about the Lord. Number six, the Lord referred to eternal life under the expression of living water. I've already covered that, so I don't do that again. And then the Lord taught her that living water was a gift, and he told her to ask for it. Now, we did a whole sermon on that word last week, so we don't have to go through that again. The point I'm trying to make, it, make is, if, if you really want to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, if you'll use your head, there will be a way. There will be a way. But if you don't want to, then of course you won't. But if you want to, there is a way. Now, to everything that we have studied so far, the woman makes this response in verse 11 and 12. Now I want to show you four things about that. So beginning now where we are in, in our study. The woman says unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep from whence hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Okay, there are four things there. Number one, her blindness to who was talking to her. She didn't have a clue. And folks, that's the way you really need to approach people. If you want to try to talk to them about the Lord, you have to assume that they don't have a clue versus people who are sitting in a Bible church their whole life. Her continued blindness. Uh, she, didn't, she did not know who this was. Now, that doesn't mean she hadn't heard the name. Because because a little later on, she talks about uh, where her people worshipped and, and, and where the Jews worship. Uh, but as far as knowing the Lord in relation to salvation, she didn't have a clue. And of course not. John 6, 44, and in another place, Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father draw him. John 12, 32. I will draw all men into me. When you witness to people, the Holy Spirit now has information to use to draw those people. And I, I tell you something I've learned uh, from the negative over to the positive through years of studying and doing this. I think uh, people who know nothing about the Lord and you give them one quick five-minute pop witness 
and then try to get them on their knees. I think that's a terrible mistake. I think one of the things that we're dealing with today, especially the independent fundamental Baptist world, uh, our, our churches are filled with people who somebody witnessed to them one time and, and they pressured them to make a profession based on that one time. And now those people think they're saved when in fact they didn't have a clue what you were talking about. We're not only having to deal today with witnessing people, we're having to deal with people that we're having to unlearn some things that they had a wrong impression of years ago and they based their salvation on that. Number two, I want you to, she's strictly occupied with uh, material things. Uh, the well is deep. Uh, and uh, you don't have a bucket. Well, let me bring that to 2017. Well, you know, I, I would love to come to your church, but I have to work something. Well, I don't have transportation. Well, I've heard bad stuff about that church. And you know, if you want to, you can make a list this long. Expect them to throw an excuse at you. Jesus warned us about that, did he not? In John 13, 22, the cares of the world are going to choke out the word. I had to practice with one of our members what I'm preaching to you this morning. Well, I won't be, he told me, I'm not going to be there Sunday because I've, I've got to get moved and I've got yard work to do and I said you, you know if you're a real Christian you know you don't need to take the Lord's day to move and do yard work. Well I gotta get moved in. Don't take God's day to do it and he got mad at me. Paul said to the Corinthian church, have I become your enemy because I told you the truth? And the answer is yeah. Sad to say. Expect excuses. Then I want you to notice her concentration is on means rather than the end. The means, wells and buckets, the end, Christ. She's setting up a physical barrier because she didn't know and she didn't want. Christ. And then, of course, number four, we pretty much covered this already in a previous lesson, the ignorance of the source of living water. Now, this is a lady that, as you study the whole experience, it's kind of like a little light, a little later, a little more light, a little later, a little more light, a little later, uh, a little more light. And folks, most people, that's how you win it. It's not like Paul. One great big explosion of light and he gets it. Even Isaiah talked about line upon line, precept upon precept, little by little by little by little. This is a, this, how this lady's one is really a pretty classic illustration of how the Lord had to walk her through it by little by little by little by little. And of course in verse 12, uh, she said, are you greater? Well, of course. Uh, uh, Jacob was a man, a prophet, but a man. But Jesus is Christ, the Christ of God. And remember, we are now dealing with a society that believes that um, Allah is a God. Muhammad was a God. Buddha is a God. And Jesus Christ, maybe. That's the society you're dealing with today. I got a uh, letter this week here at the church, a little, little booklet. Uh, I don't know if I just got that as a pastor or if that was sent out to all the church about the uh, our Stephenville football team now uh, is... Uh, a part of the curriculum now is yoga. Did I just get that as a pastor, I think, or did, did y'all get that letter? Okay. 
Do what? Was it in the paper? Well, I got a long letter about that. And, and, and really, the, the man that sent the letter to Pastor, he's right. Yoga, you do know, is a part of Buddhism. Do you know that? Anybody not know that? Don't be ashamed to raise your hand. Okay? No, yoga is a part of the Buddha religion from the Eastern world. Christians don't do yoga to get their life right with God. If you do it strictly as an exercise, but if you're being taught meditation, you want, you're a Christian. You don't meditate on your own worthiness. You meditate on the complete sufficiency of Jesus Christ for your life. Amen. But they brought yoga in now for the football team as a meditation to psych their minds up to go out there and act like animals and beat the snot out of the other team. <clears throat> now, am I all wet or is there a problem here? Problem. How do I get started on that for the game? How did I get started on this? I'm talking about this woman's ignorance of Christ. Okay, let me move on. I, can, uh, I got a spell building up on me, and whenever it's ready to bust, you'll be the ones to catch it. Is that all right? All right. Amen. Okay. Let me give you several thoughts out of verse 11. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Her mind was set on material stuff. And that's how Satan keeps people from coming to Christ. He locks them in to the cares of the world. Amen? Amen. Be surprised how many people uh, uh, will not be in church today because of the cares of the world. Uh, let, let's use an illustration. Let, let's go back to Luke 14. Luke 14. Let me give you a, a, a one that you know very well. Luke number 14. Uh, look at verse number 16. Luke 4, 16. 14, 16. Then said he of him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many and said to servants at supper time to send it to them that were bidden come. Now we know technically this is Israel invited by Christ, which they would not come. But it's also a good picture of trying to talk to people today about the Lord. For all things are not ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuses. Now just try to remember that. And don't ever be discouraged about witnessing the people. You remember Joe Cantu that was here a couple of months ago, my little Mexican buddy. I love him, they call him my fat little Mexican buddy. <laughs> and I love him like a brother, I really do, and, and, and he knows that. Uh, I talked to him earlier this morning, and he was telling me he had won a couple to Christ about 15 years ago. Last Sunday for the first time I came to church. Amen. Folks, uh, our churches need to get over this General Motors syndrome. Let me tell you something. This is slow work. This is slow work. Not much happens real quick. And we need to remember that. They all began to make excuses. First one said, I bought a piece of ground and must needs go and see it. I pray you have me excused. Uh, who buys land without looking at it? Walter, did you buy your little farm without looking at it first? Okay. Uh, Brother Hunt, of course, yours was in the family forever, but wasn't it? Yeah, but you went and looked at it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Brother Toto, did you buy that house, that nice house you're living in without looking at it? See, what a silly excuse. And another said, I bought five yoke of an ox and I go to prove them. 
Well, let me bring that to 19... 12,017. Get out of the 1900s. You're proving your age, Malice. How many of you here bought a... How many of you right here got in a car now that you, that you just never saw it, never looked at it, never drove it, you just bought it sight unseen? Anybody here? Okay. Actually, I guess you're looking at the one that did that. <laughs> that little green car I bought, I bought it for, it was wrecked. The insurance company had totaled it. I bought it for $200, sight unseen. Now, other than I did see a picture of it on the internet. But that was a different deal. Now, I, 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 I go to prove my trade, you have me now, now, this last one, the guy must have been a real idiot. And another said, I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. No reflection on you ladies. I'm sure the lady was a real jewel, but she married a nutcase. <laughs> I got a joke about that. I'm, I'm thinking, is it safe to tell it in church? <laughs> Who asked you? <laughs> it's about the guy who married a lady, but he was blind. Maybe I better save it for Deacon's meetings. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, where was I before I got off track? Uh, excuses, all right? Okay, let's move on and try to make a little progress here. Let's go, to verse, let's go on to verse number 13. Jesus answered and said unto her, Sir, a drinker of this water shall thirst again. I, I was thinking about something. Help me think through this a minute. Does that not describe our world today? As you are watching television, the news, the advertisements, how long is that new house going to satisfy? How long is that new car going to satisfy? How long is that trip to Bermuda going to satisfy? Those people who are uh, buying lotto tickets, uh, even, if they, even if they make it, how long is all that going to satisfy? Whosoever drinks of this water, in other words, everything the world has to offer, you will thirst again. Amen? Sure. Thirst again. See, man's thirst is spiritual. It's too deep for anything worldly to satisfy. Amen? Man's thirst is spiritual. Try what you will. You will thirst again. I want to go back to Luke again. Turn to Luke 16. Luke 16. Let's look at another pretty good illustration here. Luke 16. <clears throat> Let's look at uh, the rich man in Luke 16, 19. There was a rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Boy, you know, we see people like that all the time. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table where over the dogs came and licked his sores. We know people like that too, don't we? See how, see how it all came out for them. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. That's glory. The rich man also died and was buried. Notice the abruptness of the description of the death of the rich man. By the way, I'm not preaching or teaching against riches. There's nothing wrong with riches, just don't worship them. But I'll take that a step farther. If you have riches, if you're a Christian and you have riches, you need to be generous with them to help people. Don't hoard it. Anyway. And then it's very likely the kids are going to fight like cats and dogs over it. I like the 
bumper sticker that I saw once on the back of a Cadillac. I, being of sound mind, spent all my money. <laughs> we are out spending our children's inheritance. Nothing wrong with having stuff. Just don't let it go to your head, okay? So, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment to see that Abraham was far off, and Lazarus and his bosom. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember, did you know going to be memory in hell? They're going to know why they're there. That thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil, but now he's comforted, and thou art tormented. You remember Solomon? Tried it all. Money, fame, women, stuff, you name it. When he got done, he said, all is vanity. You're going to thirst again? If you Put all your apples in the basket of the world, you're going to thirst again. Let me do one more thing. Verse 14. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. I want you to notice simply four things. The water that I shall give is salvation. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Shall never thirst. The happiest people I know are Christians. And, and, and uh, they live the most satisfied lives. Not always happy, not always satisfied. But as the, the tenor of their life is usually a peaceful, quiet life. A well of water springing up, there you have growth and grace, and into everlasting life, there you have eternal security. I'm going to have to stop there. I'm going to make a note right there. I didn't get as far as I got as I wanted to get. I really wanted to get quite a bit farther, but they, the old man talked too much. So. I hope that you've picked up some tidbits there that will help you in your Christian walk and will help you if you do get the opportunity to talk to somebody and share the testimony. Hope some things there will help you. All right.